Well, good afternoon, everyone. My computer just beeped at me, so I guess it's time to start our monthly NRTRC webinar. I'm Bob Wolverton, Program Director of NRTRC, and I'll be your uh, host, I guess you can say, for today. Uh, before we get started, we have a little bit of business to take care of, and, and that involves talking about the next webinar, which will be uh, presented by Steve Trendle, who's going to talk about USA funding opportunities. Martha and I visited with uh, the USDA last month, and they have a pretty wide range of opportunities, so we hope that you'll join us to see what's available for rural, uh, rural areas for funding. And I'd also like to invite you to our sixth annual telemedicine conference. The title of that will be Next Generation Healthcare, Optimizing, optimizing Your Telehealth Programs. I wish I could read. And that's April 10th through 12th in Seattle at the uh, Olive 8 Hotel. We always have a great turnout. And in fact, uh, our presenter today was uh, a presenter at our last conference, and she had some really exciting things to share. So we are going to welcome her back. Christy McCarran is, she has a whole string of, of letters behind her name. She's a registered nurse, MBA, and CPHQ. And as with most nurses, she seems to be a constant student. Christy has 35 years of healthcare experience. 25 of those, 28 of those years have been in management and administrative roles. Christy started her nursing career as a critical care nurse and has served as the Vice President of Retail Health and Service Lines for Multicare Health System since 2009. In 2014, virtual health and home health and hospice were added to her responsibilities. Prior to her executive role, Christy served as the Administrator for Cardiovascular Services and the Administrator of MHS Quality Management. If you have questions for Christy during today's uh, webinar, you'll see a Q&A uh, pod on the right side of your screen. Please type the questions in there, and we will um, wait until the end of the presentation to go through them, and I'll kind of moderate that, that portion of the discussion. And also at the end of the webinar, when you log off or, or when we close the the webinar, you will receive a link to a survey um, asking you what you thought about today's uh, webinar and, very importantly, what you'd like to see as an NRTRC webinar in the future. So with all that out of the way, Christy, take it away. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you on the phone. Um, before I begin, I'd like to introduce my co-presenter, who is really the brains of this duo, and that is, her name is Linnell Hornbeck, who is the manager of our home health service and the one who really administers the remote patient monitoring program. Uh, I'm going to kind of sandwich her comments, so I'll do the sort of context setting at the outset. Um, Linnell will then start talking about the very specifics around the program, and if you have detailed questions about how we've um, laid out our program, then she is the one that will be addressing those. I then um, follow up toward the end with talking about our results and some sort of miscellaneous questions that we thought might be of interest to you. So. We're, we're having trouble with uh, the program. So I'll just keep going. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about MultiCare Health System, just because sometimes it's important to have context about how big we are compared to how big your health system is. We are uh, five acute care facilities, soon to be six. Um, we have a number of urgent care clinics um, retail clinics, ASCs, and we have a physician group that, a provider group that's over about 700. One of the things that I stress with my staff is that when we are trying to solve problems, if, if we try to solve it based on what we're currently doing, then we've, we've missed the point of the exercise. And so if you could see the presentation, you'd see a quote that I'm just going to read for you now. It says, one of the problems is that we are applying new technology to a broken model of care instead of using technology to facilitate a change in the model of care. And what Linnell and I are trying to accomplish here is to change the way we deliver care 
to our patients. It's not just about hospital patients transitioning. It's also about maintaining patients in their home. And so we have embarked on a journey to create what we're going to call multi-care at home. And remote monitoring is going to have a, a big piece in order to keep patients in their homes and safe. So, uh, Bob, is there any suggestions about the presentation that we need to know? Because we can't forward it for you. Need you. To be, you need to be sharing your screen, Christy. I don't know if, uh, if that's what's going on. And there's a menu on top that has share, and then you can go down and click on my screen. We don't. Okay, did that do it? Sorry. Yes, you are up there now. Okay, good. All right, so I'm sorry, everyone. I'm, my daughter calls me a technotard. I guess I proved that today. Um, so anyway, uh, multi-care remote video monitoring program. Um, we have been using video monitoring for the past 15 years, and we have been doing it for some, some very traditional reasons, to reduce avoidable readmissions, improve care coordination and access to decrease costs, improve patient and provider satisfaction, encourage sustainable health changes, and, and maybe one of the more important ones, which is to provide real-time education and feedback. But today, we are using or aspire to use remote video monitoring to, again, avoid, uh, reduce avoidable readmissions um, improve, I missed this one, didn't I? I'm going to go back a slide. I can. All right. Tomorrow, yeah, I know I can't get there. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm, I'm not able to advance the slide. So while we are looking at remote video monitoring to reduce readmissions and improve care coordination, tomorrow what I would expect us to be doing with remote video monitoring is helping to maintain patients in their home. So we would do, be doing things that would be providing continuous monitoring of health status and maybe even to extend the independent living for our elderly um, patients. The other thing to consider with remote monitoring is we have a national shortage of providers and caregivers, and so remote monitoring is one way that we can do that um, by extending them. Okay, I'm not able to advance this. I'm up. So our hypothesis I'm on page seven, if anybody can advance these for me. We seem to continue to have technical problems here on our end. Um, our hypothesis has always been that by improving our clinical outcomes with remote video monitoring, we are gonna be able to identify earlier when a patient is getting an, an infection, having exacerbation of symptoms, or even um, starting to experience a decline what I find is the most important when it comes to remote video monitoring is that you actually get to look at the patient. It's one thing to talk on the phone, and you know if you're a clinician that oftentimes patients will tell you things that they, one, think you want to hear, but if you can actually look at them, then you get a much better idea um, of what their condition is. And so I have down here, one look is worth a thousand words because I absolutely know, as a nurse, I know that to be true. We have outcomes measures that we expect to see improvement in. We'll decrease our readmit rates, our length of stay, our ED and observation days, but we also hope to increase patient engagement and satisfaction. Now, I don't expect you to just take our word for it. Um, we have uh, I've done a, a little bit of research on who's actually doing this around the country. And so I have several examples of healthcare systems around the nation that have been doing it with great success. 
And so we've included them in case it would be worth your time to give them a call and find out more information about how they were able to achieve some of the results that I'm going to share with you right now. So Lee Memorial Health System um, had about 6,000 patients in 30 months. And what they were able to accomplish was to avoid readmissions in 950 of them. And quite stunning is that they estimated $5.3 million in savings. And that, that comes down to about an 8 to 9% readmission rate, which is something I know here in this hospital we would like to have. In Rockford, Illinois, um, they saw a reduction in their heart failure readmit rate from a really high one of 31 to 14. And even Franciscan Alliance reduced their readmissions for heart failure down to 4.4%. And a similar finding when they looked at COPD um, and, and with CAV and cardiac disease. Um, uh, East Alabama was another one that had, had some different outcomes that we thought were particularly interesting in that they demonstrated a 70% improvement in patient engagement and a 50% um, improvement in quality of life. And if you're a family member or, or maybe more especially the patient, those are the kinds of things that, that you're going to pay attention to. I like the last bullet there which talks about there being an overall improvement in diet and medication compliance because Lynn, uh, Linnell will probably share with you that oftentimes it's, th it's those areas of noncompliance that get them in trouble and land them back in our hospitals. So now I'm going to turn it over to Linnell, knowing she's not going to have the same technical difficulties, <laughs> and she'll tell you more about the multi-care model. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, letting us uh, share with you a little bit about our program. As Chrissy uh, shared with you, we have been doing remote monitoring uh, for about 15 years. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the most uh, recent years and our, our focus uh, has shifted in where we want to go as we move into the future. So we have, um, as you can expect, traditionally uh, really focused initially upon the heart failure cardiac population. And that simply is because literature um, has pretty much supported that as being the population where you receive the best benefit uh, traditionally. And it was definitely the primary focus was to reduce our readmission rates and improve our overall clinical outcomes. Our initial patients were all patients that were part of our healthcare system multi-care. As well, initially, um, and in 2014, we primarily focused on patients who were getting concurrent home health. Uh, so this is really uh, basically an additional uh, clinical tool that we're, we were using with our home health patients. We did actually admit patients into the program that had all payers, uh, so Medicare, Medicaid, uh, commercial payers, um, as well as we did use the program for some of our patients who were uh, what we would call financial assistance, where they really had no payer, but uh, because it was a benefit for them to come home from the hospital, we would admit them into our home health program and use remote monitoring as an additional tool. In 2015, we continued with our focus on heart failure, but we began to look a little bit closer at some of our outcomes, and particularly around the respiratory COPD population. As Christy shared, there are other uh, healthcare systems that are starting to use uh, this technology for the pulmonary and COPD population. Well, the literature was not as supportive of there being as positive results, but we felt fairly confident uh, because of our outcome results with the heart failure and some of the lessons we learned that we want to take that challenge on and start to apply it to this additional population. As uh, later on in my slides, I will talk a little bit more about the unique nature of the COPD pneumonia population and what we have used with this component to impact our outcomes. Uh, we did, as I said, look at um, adding um, those metrics. We do track our metrics for both our heart failure and COPD patients. Uh, we actually did a lot of partnering with our healthcare system. So we have uh, different collaboratives in medicine, collaboratives, we have surgical clinical collaboratives that we all work to very closely with, as well as of our different market uh, providers, so that we would be able to be in alignment with the system initiatives, the system protocols. We, as I will talk later, developed a lot of um, clinical applications that we wanted to have input from our system. 
We also worked very closely with our personnel health partners. Personnel health partners is our program that MultiCare uses, uh, formerly uh, case management, but really has, uh, we revamped that program to really be uh, more appropriate for uh, working with uh, transitions population. It exists both in the hospital, the acute care setting, as well as in the ambulatory setting. We additionally in 2015 decided that we want to look at, um, traditionally this program had really been, as I said, for home health patients. But we felt that this program really could be something that would benefit patients who weren't necessarily in the home health program. And so we implemented a pilot program. We focused, it, focused on our COPD patients, and these were patients who were not admitted into our home health program. So the intervention was purely the remote monitoring. There really weren't in-home visits. Um, it was all done virtually. Uh, that actually program was very successful. We had zero readmissions during that pilot for those uh, patients. As far as looking at other partnerships, uh, we are looking at expanding outside of our traditional system patient population and looking at doing risk contracting and ACO models. As well, we feel, as Christy uh, talked with earlier, we're looking at um, multi-care at home as being a very um, key strategy for our post-acute care. We all know that the population management is moving into the post-acute care uh, much more heavily than it's going to be as it has been traditionally in the acute care setting alone. So we want to uh, really uh, use this uh, technology that we've had success with in that uh, realm as well. So a little bit of a, a program overview. Uh, we have had 70 monitors. We actually just recently moved into a growth span uh, stage where now have elevated to 100 monitors. Uh, we also um, service anywhere between 650 to 750 patients annually are the number of patients that we have admitted into our program. I will tell you that it is a very intensive program. Uh, at this point, the patients that we are seeing are fairly sick uh, with multiple comorbidities, uh, very often heart failure, COPD, and many of them have diabetes as well. So we are doing very intense interventions, which I will talk a little bit more about the specific interventions, but we do track those to really demonstrate uh, the actual uh, number of interventions we do per month, and it averages um, anywhere between 450 interventions. Our staffing ratio, it has traditionally been, uh, up until recently, an RN and tech model, but with our growth stage, we have added LPNs to that model, and that's been quite successful. Uh, we actually find the LPN does quite well with many aspects of the monitoring program, and it is much more cost-effective for us to utilize LPN-RN uh, ratio. Our current uh, distribution model is we are, we do distribute either through our home health staff if, it's a, if it is a home health patient, or if it is a non-home health patient, our tech does install the monitor in the home. I will talk briefly a little bit about installation and the importance of the initial um, setup for the monitor. It is very, very important that that go smoothly, that it be done correctly. That, the, that you take time to really work with that patient for them to understand the equipment um, and how they're going to use it. We have found that if that does not go smoothly, there is a very high correlation with non-compliance. Uh, they just, even though you may correct the error, they somehow associate that with maybe not quite believing that it is, it's an accurate um, technology and they just don't comply as much. Uh, our workflow, uh, we do install the telemonitor on the, on the first day when they are home from the hospital. If it is a patient who re is receiving our home health program, it is our goal to admit within 24 hours. If for some reason that is not going to happen, we do install the monitor on the first day home from the hospital. That's been very successful. Our patients really like having some kind of connection with us. Um, we actually have protocols that we were able to implement if there is a problem, and it really allows us to get a first look at that patient. We do monitor our patients seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, as I said, the RN or the LPN do look at that data and act accordingly. I will talk a little bit more about how that works. Currently, our uh, monitoring is centralized here within our um, home health department. We do do our own monitoring. 
We have looked at other uh, models where they do outsource it, but at this time our decision is to maintain that in-house because we've had quite um, good success with our outcomes. Uh, the um, program itself is a web-based program that allows you to sort depending upon clinical variances, and I will show you a screenshot later of what that looks like. It really is as well as it's not just responding to aberrations or when there's a clinical um, indicator, but it's really looking at population health management, and that's part of where we want to go with this growth program is we want to look at bringing populations, patient population on that is a little more stable that we can get upstream and really help them to maintain their health and not um, necessarily concentrating on just the patients who have had an acute incident in the hospital. Uh, we also have um, an integrated software system. It is called EPIC and this is quite advantageous in that it allows us to communicate with our providers uh, with the information, as well as our staff do uh, look at the information in our software system, in our uh, medical record, to really look at the proactive case management. One example will be if our patients are going, have seen their provider, uh, our heart failure clinic, our telehealth staff basically act as a case manager. They will go in, they will review that information, and then they contact that patient and review what the plan was, medication changes, uh, and you will be probably not surprised to know how many times um, the patient didn't understand what the plan was, they hadn't got their medication, so it really allows us to help reinforce what that plan was and to know that we're all on the same sheet of music. The next is actually the a screen that you will see. Those of you that have, are familiar with remote monitoring, there are many different programs. Um, some have different features, but in this particular program, what you will see is it's color-coded. It's a nice, easy, quick see to look at what are the alerts. Um, we actually set specific patient parameters for our patient depending on their specific disease state, and uh, then we will respond to anything that is a red alert. We typically will prioritize, uh, because we do have both COPD and heart failure patients, we typically tend to prioritize the COPD patients, and that is just as particularly with patients who are newly admitted into our program, there is a very high anxiety component associated with that disease process. If we do not contact them fairly immediately to have the conversation and work with them towards an intervention plan, they will be on their way to the emergency room. As well, so the monitor itself does some biometric. It's a tablet-type device that does biometric uh, monitoring. It also has custom disease management templates, which allow us to ask specific assessment questions that the patient will answer yes or no to. As well, it allows us to give them prompts or cues to take their medication would be an example. And another really wonderful feature that I like to talk about is that it actually uh, helps to motivate our patients. There are little uh, phrases that we can put in to the, uh, into the program that allow us to uh, acknowledge successes that the patient has had. For example, if a patient perhaps has been struggling with fluid retention, diet compliance, and with work um, have managed to get that under control and have, instead of being all reds, now they have three days of green, our staff will go ahead and program that into the uh, template, and the patient will see that when they log on to their um, uh, to log in to enter their information for the day. And you would be amazed how much that just little bit of encouragement is meaningful to the patient. We do use uh, several standardized tools along with the remote, remote monitoring. As I said, we do have a flexible diuretic dosing guideline. We have several uh, self-management tools, uh, sodium diet tools. We actually have uh, designed along with our um, medical director, a holiday diet handout uh, that helps our patients to maybe make better selections, helping them to see what they can, concentrating on what they can eat versus telling them what they cannot eat. Those of you that work with this population know that it must works much better to, to speak with them towards what they are able to do versus what they, are, they cannot do. We also have a weight tracking tool, which is a very simple tool. It's, uh, it's the yellow, green, red stoplight um, uh, mechanism in which they will uh, mark their weight and then whether it was yellow, green, or red, 
And as well, we encourage them to mark how they were feeling on that day, and that really helps to tie when their weight is up and it's red, they're not feeling so great, or maybe they're not able to do a particular activity that they like to enjoy. And that really helps them to, again, motivate why, why when they are able to better manage their disease, they actually are able to um, have um, uh, just a better life. Uh, we also, as well, have standardized pathways for both our COPD and our heart failure patients. Um, which help us to uh, drive what, the, what we clinically are going to be doing with the patient. And that, if they are in home health, that is um, coordinated with the pathway that occurs in the home with the cl clinicians that are seeing the patient. I've talked a little bit about some of this, but then again, we do uh, work at very intensive upfront clinical interventions with our patients. Uh, we see them or have contact with them daily for the first three days. Uh, the advantage of this program is uh, it does have a video component, which I'm going to talk a little bit more here on some later slides, but that's a, a component that we were able to, with an upgrade to our equipment, um, implement about two years ago. And that really allows you to be able to actually do remote or virtual visits, which is wonderful and advantageous. It really has helped us to engage our patients from a cost-effective um, perspective, it is actually saved us money in that we don't actually have to actually go physically out into the home. I've talked a little bit already about that we do install the telemonitor on the first day. We do contact the patient if there's any, uh, any particular um, parameters that are uh, out, of, out of the parameter. I'll talk a little bit about now, in particular, our COPD. As I said, that was a new uh, realm for us to take on the COPD uh, population. And we really feel that what made a big difference with the, our success with that population is the use of the video visit. And um, what I will tell you is we have a, a saying around here that talk, teach is dead. It's all about touch, teach now. And this is by having video technology, you are able to touch that patient in a different way you were able to interact with them, to engage with them. And what I will tell you is this is not just them talking to the patient. They actually will have the patient interact. Some specific examples are we actually do a little bit of biofeedback. We will have the patient, uh, if they're, they're having um, a particular intervention, such as the use of their nebulizer or their inhaler <clears throat> or their breathing treatment, um, relaxed breathing, whatever the particular um, intervention that we are working with the patient on. We will have them do a bio biometrics that prior to the treatment, and then we have them do it again afterwards. And it is very, very powerful for the patient to see the immediate impact that by doing that, for example, their nebulizer treatment has on their breathing, their oximetry. We will also use sometimes incentive spirometer to help them to see how it improves their volume. Uh, patients come home from the hospital with orders that will say things like, use your nebulizer or your breathing treatment PRN as needed. And for a patient, that means, well, when they're you know, just about ready to drop down on the floor. We all know as clinicians, these patients particularly who are status post an acute incident, you know, PRN as needed is really best for that initial time home on a scheduled basis. So this really helps them to understand and to buy into the fact that this really is an effective treatment. Uh, we also do, um, with the video, we do screen sharing. We will share with them their parameters so they can see that. We actually will screen share with them um, the visit notes when they've gone into a provider or to the heart failure clinic to actually see this is the treatment plan, this is what was discussed with you. Let's talk about that a little bit more. We actually, um, our clinicians actually have gone out and set, um, obtained uh, different popular grocery items. They have, I think it's like the top, most popular 20 items. And they will, they will actually ask the, the patient if they can go to their kitchen and get their own grocery items, but sometimes they're not able to. So they will use, basically say, we're going to go on a shopping trip. And they will use those items to do label teaching with the patients and uh, work with them on um, uh, managing their sodium. They've actually um, also created some very uh, unique teaching tools. One of them I will talk about is sodium dollars. And what they have done is they have taken and translated, um, you know, the 2,000 milligrams or whatever their limit is on sodium and translated that into dollars. 
And then they give the patient these dollars and then they have them shop with them using the most popular items that they want for sodium. And it's very impactful. Uh, the patients really start to understand what that really means. The other thing I want to emphasize is that it's the right intervention at the right time. Clearly, we want to try to avoid to decrease our avoidable readmissions. For this tool, it sometimes has been used to determine that the right intervention is for that person to seek higher level of care. We've had several occasions where the clinician was actually uh, on the video with the patient or on the phone and then moved to a video visit to identify that that patient needed to um, contact 911. They had the patient call 911 and stay on the phone with the patient until 911 arrived. And these um, were very important to help to get that patient into the higher level of care. And we believe by identifying that at the right moment, we were able to decrease the length of stay that the patient had in the acute care. The other thing is just to emphasize, again, remote monitoring, it is only a tool. The technology is only as good as any clinical protocols or interventions that you have in place. You must be very proactive in intervening or the, the tool is not going to be effective. We talked a little bit already about the video component, increasing engagement. Um, really, these patients that come to us um, have multiple comorbidities. They can be very disillusioned at times. Only either by their own experience, perhaps they've been in the hospital multiple times. Some of these patients are multi-generational, -gener especially with the diabetics. We find these patients may have had parents or grandparents who had very poorly uh, managed disease, and they just saw the negative outcome and have pretty much decided that there is really nothing that they can do to manage this disease. So we really work to identify with the patients what, what do they feel confident they can manage. What is it that they can achieve? And we start there. And then by using the video component and the um, tying their behavior modification to the results, we are able to celebrate the success with them. Our monitoring program is typically 30 to 45 days. We are looking at probably expanding our average length of stay as we move into bundled patients, where you're looking at trying to keep them out of the hospital for 90 days. But regardless of what the length of your program is, you must uh, instill in the patients a mechanism for them to be able to manage their disease so that when they are no longer on the program, they will continue to have success. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Chrissy to share some results. Great. Thank you, Linnell. So I have the very great pleasure of, of showing you some of our results um, on our COPD and heart failure patients. Um, and then I'm going to spend some time talking about where we have begun in 2016 and where we hope to finish up in 2017. So here's our results. We had baselines as a system um, of heart failure readmits in around the 20% range. Last year, um, the remote monitoring program had what I thought was a great uh, rate of 5.1 for readmissions, but our data for this year is even better. So this goes through August of this year, so it's current and they're at 3%. Um, I can't underscore enough how important those interventions that our nursing staff are doing is making in terms of the readmit rate. If you think about who these patients are that get put into home health, they tend to be the sicker ones. So they have more complexity in terms of comorbidities. And so for us to have a system rate of around 20, which still is in heart failure, maybe it's down to 18, I'm, I'm not very proud of that. But what I am proud of is the fact that our home health team has been able to take a very sick group of patients and by monitoring them on a regular basis, interspersed with video remote monitoring, we can demonstrate readmit rates down as low as 3%. That same scenario is being played out for COPD. We started um, at baseline at 20. Right now, as a system, it's somewhere around, I want to say, 10 to 12 percent. But again, here in home health, um, this year, they're down to 5 percent in terms of COPD readmissions. So um, I'm particularly proud of the work that Linnell and her team have done. So now I want to take you into what we've been sort of experimenting with here in 2016 and what we have left on our plate to do, because there's always something that we're dreaming up to do. 
So we started out this year um, imagining how we could broaden this program outside of just those who qualified for home health. Um, we felt that that was limiting in terms of the number of patients that we could see. The problem is that unless you have a home health visit, you really don't have any reimbursement. I mean, there's some, I'll share some Medicare stuff at the end, but it's so nominal. Uh, you have to wonder if it's worth all the paperwork that it takes to put it in. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. But nonetheless, um, we said high-risk patients come are in more categories than just heart failure and COPD. So I'm going to share on the next slide some of the criteria we used to sort of broaden the scope of the patients that we wanted to monitor. And this took off through a collaboration with our personal health partners or our case management program. Um, and it was intended to expand our telemonitoring service. Um, we also knew that if we got really good at this, we could, we could even enhance the video visit technology and do other things like wound assessment, biofeedback, which I think they're already um, doing effectively. But what about physical therapy? And then what about um, education, which I believe they can um, almost program into? Not yet, she says. But that would be a dream then. So here is our inclusion and exclusion criteria for the broader base of patients that we intend to cover. Well, actually, we are. Um, but we're limiting it to a primary diagnosis of CHF, COPD, and pneumonia during this pilot phase so that we can do um, demonstrate a return on investment. Um, for those patients that have a high readmission risk score of either high, intensive, or medium, or those that have greater than two ED visits within the past six months, they're the population that we're targeting. And all of these patients must be discharging to home. Now, the exclusion criteria, not surprisingly, is for those patients that aren't discharging to home, so they're going to another facility. Um, we've also excluded those heart failure patients with an ICD implant. I do want to say, though, that while we have excluded um, the SNF population at this juncture, that is not um, how we are currently planning. We created a SNF network this past year, and we have um, 13 facilities that we work with across all three of our markets, and that narrow network um, is allowing us to coordinate care in a much different way. And because now we are as interested in their readmit rates as they are in ours, um, and we share data freely, it's important for us to give them the technology that will help them as well. So we have plans to put remote monitoring um, in our nursing homes as well, and we'll figure out how best to coordinate those efforts. So again, it won't necessarily have to be a home health patient that gets the advantages of this technology. Um, this was part of our um, initial looking at how we might scale this. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because when Vanel talked a bit about the staffing ratios, they would apply here. But it just gives you a sense of how we are trying to scale it up. So in case you ever have to do your own pro forma to present to your leadership, this would give you a sense of how you might do that. And you can see here that we intentionally increased the nursing caseload from 27 to 75 patients per FTE. Um, now I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk more about population health management because we have our own multi-care connected care. That's our clinically integrated network. And so we are responsible for tens of thousands of lives. And, and it's always important to understand what is the cost of care what is the per member per month cost, and are you increasing it or decreasing it with the things that you do? Um, with the use of this technology, if there's no home health visit associated with it, um, just doing it like we are now for, let's say, 30 days, the, the cost would be about 582 uh, additional dollars per member per month. So you see, it's $21 a day. That's, that's not inexpensive over a, a period of time. But if we expanded the model and you do it over 60 days that you're responsible for in bundled payments, then all of a sudden you're starting to make a difference in terms of the risk that you're placing of, of that population. 
Um, I found that the information from Geisinger was particularly helpful and that they demonstrated a 44% decrease in 30-day readmits, but an even better 50% decrease in 60 days. And then a nod to all the CFOs is that uh, demonstrated 11% cost savings, which is, translates to $3.30 um, return on investment to the health plan. Which doesn't sound like much to those of us that grew up in the hospital, but if you're in on the payer side, that's, that's something to pay attention to. So now I'm going to just briefly touch on reimbursement. I'm not an expert. I'll just, that's my disclaimer up front. Um, I do have an individual here who understands it better than I do, so if you want more information, we can get you hooked up with her. But roughly, uh, when it comes to reimbursement from, from Medicaid, this is the list of states that actually have some a remote patient monitoring reimbursement built into it. You can say there's something, you see there's something additional in Pennsylvania and South Dakota. Um, the Washington State Medicaid program actually uh, covers the delivery of home health services through telemedicine, so I, we, we put those up there for you as well. And you can see those that are eligible. Um, and, but this service does need to be provided by a registered nurse or licensed practical nurse, and, and our program was designed around some of those parameters. What I thought was really important and progressive for Medicaid was the last bullet you see here is that Medicaid um, didn't require prior authorization for the delivery of home health services via telemedicine, which might be the first time somebody didn't want pre-off for something. That's just my cynical aside. Um, in terms of Medicare reimbursement, this is the one that I was talking about before. You can get reimbursed for um, care coordination. Um, but it's a little onerous. They have to be first established with a primary care physician who is the one that has to do the billing. You see some of the requirements there. But you get a facility, a non-facility fee of $46.20 a month. Um, that's, that's barely able to cover the cost of the people that are having to process the billing. And so because of the complexity um, that's been involved. We're not actively doing this, at least with this program. There are other areas in our healthcare system that are, but we haven't found it to be anything but um, challenging to pull that off and make it worth our time and effort. So to sort of wrap things up here, where do we go from here? I think my dream would be that we deploy this across our entire system, across all high-risk patients, and that this just be part and parcel to any risk contract that we engage in. Because I, I really do believe that this is a program that has benefits well beyond what we're currently seeing if we're limited to a home health population by, by virtue of how we're presently getting paid. Um, one of the ways that you could perhaps scale this faster and get more economies of scale would be to seek out regional partners so that you could scale faster. Um, you might even look at different payers that you could partner with in order to accomplish that. And I've already talked, um, both Linnell and I have talked already about how um, it is our strategy to develop with this, this program with our post-acute partners. And while it was a dream just six months ago, it's um, going to be ready for deployment here probably within the next month or two. So we're, we're proud of that. So I think I will stop at this point and allow those of you that have questions to um, type those in or however Bob instructs you to, to do that. Thank you, everyone. Well, thanks, uh, Christy and Linnell. For, I find this, this remote patient monitoring subject to be very fascinating personally, and um, I, I've seen a lot of statistics. I wonder, Christy, um, you talk about readmission rates. Has, has anyone in your organization calculated, I guess it would be a guesstimate, of how many ER visits have been avoided with remote monitoring? Well, we haven't, if we haven't gone that far yet, to, so I don't have that data, but we do have it on the list to try and capture as we look at our risk populations that we're responsible for more closely. So if you ask me in six months, we'll have some data. Okay, I'll do that. 
Uh, we've also got a question from Larry. Um, he asks, what is the approximate cost of the home monitors? It's about $90 a month. We, you know, it varies by the number of monitors you have. So, it, it's, you know, we can tell you about what it is, but you may have a different monitor at a different price. There is some variability in the marketplace. So I would encourage you to look at several vendors and see what works best for you. There are differences in terms of how the monitors are distributed, which is something to pay attention to. Um, one of the, the issues we identified as we were looking at monitors was who can get it to the patient the most quickly. And, you know, it would be fabulous if you could get it to the patient so it was there the first day after they were discharged and then the patient would just have to mail it back in. Wouldn't that be great? Well, it doesn't work that well because it would take at least, gosh, three or four days at best to even get there. And it's that first 24 to 72 hours that are the most critical in these patients. And so that's why we chose to keep it in-house in terms of distribution. It doesn't mean that down the line when we get more patients, we might not have a combination of the two and it would be more uh, risk or criteria based in terms of who gets it distributed from our own store, if you will. Um, but right now, for the patients that home health is seeing, they're high enough risk that they act, as Linnell said, they need that monitor either on their way out of the hospital or they need it the next day. And so that, that's kind of what we've, um, that, that's the decision we arrived at in terms of distribution. It's not inexpensive. Don't forget to factor in if you, if you take on that service from this company, they're going to tag on postage fees and handling fees and, and all of that with it. So you really probably should look at can we do it more cheaply ourselves, but then you've got the whole logistics distribution stuff and the equipment cleaning that you have to pay attention to, or do you totally outsource it and be happy with somebody only able to deliver it within, let's say, four days of discharge? So I think there's, there's things for you to weigh out in terms of your choices. Yeah, there's, there's so much to think about. I, I know of one program that is, uh, they own their own equipment and they deliver it, but then they have to uh, check for end of life and send it off for repair and clean it themselves. So yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of issues to deal with on that. We have a question from Kathy. She wonders how this program coordinates specifically with your uh, clinic or hospital-based care managers and wonders, do you utilize other clinicians such as pharmacists or dietitians? Uh, so this is Linnell, I'll respond to that. Um, we actually uh, coordinate uh, because, as I said, we are, are an integrated healthcare record and healthcare system. So yes, yeah, so we actually coordinate quite closely. Uh, we coordinate as far as warm handoffs with the uh, person health partners or case management from the acute care setting. And then as far as if they do have an ambulatory personal health partner who is following them in the community, we uh, actually are communicating in a variety of ways, whether it's actually phone calls, joint visits, if they are in home health. Um, as far as the telehealth or remote monitoring, they do a lot of actually electronic communication uh, back and forth. Um, we don't actually have a pharmacist on staff. We have talked about, and um, that's one of the things we've talked about potentially as growth would be able to use this virtual um, technology to use for pharmacy, for pharmacy and med, reconcil med reconciliation, but we haven't got there yet. Okay. Um. We get another question from Larry. Uh, he clarified his first one and, and said he was wondering about the actual cost of the monitors, but then also wonders how the monitors connect. Is that uh, broadband, cell phone, telephone line? Yeah, it's all it's wireless. Uh, wireless. I think it's it's 4G. But yeah, they're all wireless um, connectivity. It's it's been quite interesting to see the revolution. Um, or evolution, I'm sorry, of uh, the monitors. When we first started the program, they were pretty clunky. They had to be connected to a landline. You all probably can figure out that many people don't have line, landlines anymore. So yeah, it's, it's all, um, they're Bluetooth and it's all, uh, I guess, cellular uh, connections. 
So the monitors are not our monitors. We're leasing. Them, and and correct? that's correct. We we have, we have chosen to lease the monitors, um, and it it is interesting. It's not over here on the west coast. It's it's not as uh, popular. We're actually one of the few games in town that are doing remote monitoring. So we've we've kind of learned our lessons by talking to the mid and east coast, where it's a little bit uh, more prevalent. And you will find a variety of models. Some have chosen to buy their own monitors. We chose to lease because we felt that it is such a changing technology. We wanted to keep up with that technology. If you have any more questions for Chris, Chris or Linnell, uh, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A pod, and uh, we'll relay them back. If not, while we're waiting to see if we have one more question, uh, I'll remind everyone that, that today's slides will be available along with the recording of today's session on our website. Uh, nrtrc.org uh, as soon as we get the video process and, and get a chance to get it uploaded. It, it usually doesn't take very long. Uh, we often find that people like to re-watch a webinar and, and oftentimes more people watch the recording than actually attend the webinars. So uh, that's a very valuable option for you. Looks like we have another question coming in. And Kevin, you mentioned a variety of manufacturers. What are you currently using for devices? We are using currently Honeywell. I'll follow up a little bit on that. You did some due diligence, I presume, and yeah. determined that the Honeywell device was was more meeting, more fitting with your needs, I guess. At this point, we feel that, that that's the the best device for what our program is for right now, correct? And, and yes, we have done due diligence searches. Yeah, there are so many providers, and as you said, Christy, the, the market, the technology changes so frequently that um, I'm sure you'd encourage anyone who's considering starting up an RPM program to look at everything uh, very carefully again. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? I don't see anything coming in. We'll uh, give about 30 seconds, and in that time, I will thank Christy and Linnell again for uh, joining us and sharing this information. I, I, as I said, I really am very fascinated by remote monitoring and think that's a significant portion of the future of medical care. So uh, thank you very much for sharing your afternoon with us and giving us this information. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone needs to get in contact with uh, Christy or Linnell,